Hunter x Hunter, episode 88, Rock, Paper, Scissors, X, and X, Weakness. Oh yeah, they didn't sleep, and then they, they did all that. That would be a terrible time to get attacked. How do we go from like Shia Labibouf and Murathalua Lua whatever, Murathalua Fufu, to Knuckles and Shot? Shoot? Yeah, I even got that wrong. Some people in the show are better at coming up with memorable names than others. If only we had someone in our party that could, you know, like heal. Yeah, they're getting ripped. It's not just me. They're animating the ripness. Imagine an alternate universe where, like, they die and it's all because of Bisky. You need a hand, kids. Like, really? Okay. Oh, he's shook. Oh, he looked so cool in the outro last time. Oh, he's another softy. This is two big softies. Shuto Makumaho. Softy McMahon. Oh, yeah, that's kind of sweet. <laughs> Poor guy. Glad he didn't like just attack two injured kids though. Man, like a lot of people think they're fighting their enemies or the world. The truth is they're just fighting themselves. To give him the full benefit of the doubt, which he may or may not deserve, he may not even have been looking at Gon and Klua in a key sense. Like he may not have even registered the logistics of attacking two injured kids because he couldn't see past his own desperation. Gon asking really important questions. It's that good, huh? Yeah, a lot of animal lives lost. So is Kite. And it turned out great for him. <laughs> Walk myself into that one. Just defeated myself. Speaking of which. <laughs> He's got responsibilities here at home. Jokes about Bisky aside, I I'm always touched by how much she just loves and admires them. She, I mean, what's in it for her at this point, you know? There's no gemstones here. It's just legit, all for them. Ah, yes. <laughs> Bomb. The character I said was very relatable to me. Mm hmm. She might be a little bit weird and neurotic. Why did the knife have an eye of its own? Stabby stabby. Oh damn. My emotions are swinging wildly. Pam for the win. Pam for the win. I think Pam. Pam. Why do I keep calling her Pam? Pam could use some food herself. I don't think she eats. Neuroticism too high. Anxiety is great for keeping a slim figure. Follow for more diet tips. Haikyuu is so, such an influential show for me in thinking about the whole genius thing. I say this because it just sprung to mind how deeply methodical this is. Well, the thought I had before that was it's kind of funny that the challenge that they need to complete before the deadline is only made mandatory by Gonin Kalua. If they were purely outcome determined, they could just ask him for the piece at this point, you know, or could have taken it from him when they knocked him out. And then the follow up to that is no, their goal is not getting the piece, it's beating the ants. And they have identified what they most need to do in order to make that possible. It's very, very like structurally sound. It reminds me of um, um, Kida, the, the team captain, and his focus on what I would put as being process oriented over being results oriented, where raw energy and enthusiasm can only take you so far. A cool insight about the show though, especially season four, rather than the, the approach determining the level or state of one's genius, it's the mindset, where if you have the right mindset, the right mindset will inevitably, though it might take, take some time, point you to the right methodology, the right combination of practices. I think that's partly the genius of Shonen as a whole. It's why there's a lot of commonality between principal characters. It's often things like un 
unbeatable spirit, the ability to do difficult things to grow, not being super egotistical or prideful about knowing everything before you know it, being willing to sacrifice elements of what you are for what you could become. Golan, I think in this arc especially, showing why he's such a great example of that. Because his base personality is not so much methodology, perfectionism, right? Like he's just headstrong and he rushes into things and he wants to take on every challenge immediately. But because he has like this much higher calling and guiding star, he will end up going that way. He will end up diving into the method methodology with that same spirit as sort of a symptom of that spirit. It's a light that points the way. And just saying this out loud now, perhaps one great thing about Kalua is that Kalua, while being great in his own way, is sort of not that. And he, he gives a little bit of an outside perspective on it. Or maybe it's that he is the same, but that his leaning, his process leaning is opposite to Gon. Yet since they both have that same shining star, they end up converging. <laughs> Unbeatable spirit. Pam just not cut out to be a shonen protagonist, unfortunately. Stabby, stabby. Intensifies. <laughs> and apparently the knife stares back. Well, we got a couple hours, so... Oh, we don't need to sleep. <laughs> Gohan just doesn't care about the potential knife in his kidneys. <laughs> oh, they went there. Why am I surprised? Hunter Hunter. It's not 1% as bad as anything we've seen from Hisoka. Gohan just unabashedly himself forms his own gravity. How to win friends and influence psychos. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about this because I've been talking a lot about this or maybe the other way around, but I'd say right now I'm in kind of a nice place mentally. The specifics are not really relevant, but my life, while often quite chaotic, is like more chaotic than usual, maybe ever. Yet I've been noticing that I'm in very high spirits most of the time. I can attribute it to a lot of different things simultaneously, but one thing that's relevant here is that I feel like I've shifted a lot of my focus or the way I'm trying to navigate the world from the world itself and the, the circumstances of what's going on and just like trying to foster an autonomy of thought and spirit, like real mental and emotional agency. I think my entry point into there may be a little bit arrogant, but I think that's okay as a placeholder while I explore the space. Sometimes it gets to a point where for me to get emotionally affected by things that are happening or by other people or what people say is kind of disgusting for me. That somebody could be so above me that what they do is more important than what I think or that anybody or anything should be allowed to touch my core that I don't choose. I think maybe one way there is to systematically checking off through action, the things you need to do to feel like you have sufficient torque on your own life and getting the things you most need and getting the things that you want. This comes to mind because again, going to a great example, Palm just like flying out the handle, Gon just being Gon. Like it doesn't touch his core at all. And if I had to guess, like I was saying, I think part of that is Gon throughout his very young life has been told that things were impossible. Like I actually just accidentally clicked on the first episode again and realized it started with him catching a fish that nobody could catch except for Jing. He just does the things he wants to do. And he's done that enough times that he just knows he, he can do what he wants to do. He is the source of his own success or failure, not other people and what they think or how they feel, unless there's a direct physical dangerous threat right in front of them. So it's like so much water on a raincoat. A lot of times things are only really emotionally triggering when it like hits on a fear that you don't know how to address or you can't imagine solving. But the more competent you feel in your ability to handle your own business and state, the less you rely emotionally and I guess materially on like the whims of the world. And like with this, it's magnetic. I also think that if you get far enough along on that scale, it's sort of like something accumulating mass. The bigger your mass or your personal independence, the greater gravity. The person with the greater gravity will swallow the energy of the person with the smaller energy. Meaning that since they are less personally independent, have less of an autonomy or ability to personally decide their own reactions, you being the more solid one, they will naturally act acclimate to the one that's less moving, more solid. And you find as you get stronger and stronger, you're absorbing more and more. Great example of that was Gon just now, who in this dark, serious moment, did this really goofy pinky swear thing for which Parm, uh, Parm Palm had no choice but to just go with it. Because like, what, what else is she gonna do? She has no ability to affect Gon's outlook. Things are getting tense. You can tell by the music. Corita. Gee, I wonder what animal <laughs> that thing is from. This, like, this guy, genuinely no idea. Queen ate an ogre, zombie. You're about to go into a hole. Good, 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 good for them to feel fear a little bit. 
Thank God that pig creature covered up his left breast, the unibra. Whoops. Into the Matrix loading room. It is great. It is amazing. It does make them look amazing. But Nefropito and the other two. <laughs> Not even bothering with the one-on-one. -on -one. It's like, you know, hating McDonald's and trying to take them out by throwing french fries on the floor of a single franchise. It's like, yeah, this is mildly irritating for their cause. Take that, McDonald's. Oh, are they getting bored? Well, I have a great idea for you. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's a great shot. It's also funny because arc to arc, I've noticed in this show, it's harder for me to predict or anticipate any of the storyline elements because things just change so quickly. Early on in this arc, I was thinking that Colt was going to be a key element in defeating the ants because of his human connection. And that still might be true, but he also seems a lot less relevant given the escalation in power levels. I wonder if they two are sleeping on the royal guard. That Neverpedo introduction was just so, so convincing. Like, I can't get over it. Gross. Ew. <laughs> Oh, they're just, yeah. Wow, they're... This is blasting them through their barriers. It's great looking at it. Bisky continues to impress, being just absolute best love interest. I mean, teacher. Oh no, it's starting to come out. <laughs> Oh yeah, I agree. With whatever she just said. <laughs> Bisky acting like she couldn't handle all of this by herself. Possibly including that for me too. I don't know, I just feel it. I feel it. Something about the confidence. Bisky just having a good time out here. I like how their aura is unified. Okay, we're gonna battle with love. There's no, no hate here. <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible. How could you? How could you? I want to hang out with Knuckles so bad. He has arrived. The king is here. Oh, the violin playing is real. Oh, I was asking who was going to be the artist. Turns out it's this dude. Oh no, they're developing culture. Is this kite? Wait, I'm confused what I'm looking at. Wait, what was that? Is that Neverpedo's Nen? Oh, Oh, it's not the king, it's it's the third. That really makes sense. I was wondering why the sack was hanging from the ceiling. Good. Love that name. Thinking about it some more, I think the genius of Neverpedo's introduction was how unceremonious it was. It was just like, squirt, and then she was there. Like in the video, you can see I didn't even really register something was happening at first. The significance of the event contrasted with the insignificance of her entrance made it really striking. I bet they have a plan, even though we didn't see it. Like what Kalua said about knowing your opponents is not mutually exclusive with focusing on getting stronger. Isn't it that at a certain point, the ants and the queen have won? Like the king already is almost here. They have a huge storage of human meatballs. Tough to bet against Nedaro though. The, the rules say something about having to fight one on one? Okay, we're learning. We're learning. Uh, yeah, like up to now, people just kind of wait for going to do it. Yeah, 
It's a gamble. Well, if it makes him feel any better, Kite has already been sacrificed. And judging by that violin montage, it looks like it's what I feared, that he's coming back as an enemy. But he's also on strings, so could he be cut? I don't know. What's ominous about what Netro said is not the idea that people can die, because that's obvious. That's a given and not his fault. But it feels like there could be a little bit of, like, him knowingly, deliberately treating one of them as a pawn, as, like, a deliberate sacrifice in a strategy, which is kind of dark considering, you know, the, these were all students. The tension of these episodes since Neferpito's introduction has been so great. Like, we're watching Gon and Kalua struggle somewhat desperately to catch up to Knuckle, who's weaker than Netero, who's probably weaker than Neferpitu. That's been our whole focus recently. And in that time, two more Neferpitos have been born. So it's like, for what exactly? The scale of the Royal Guard, who are not even at the King's level, has been so well established that everything else that happens feels like cute, you know? I'm trying to think of an analogy. It's something like, I'm a couch potato and I'm told I have to run a race against college track athletes in a week to save humanity. And then I just bust my ass training for a week and on the seventh day in the enemy track team's locker room, three Usain bolts hatch out of sacks, perfectly formed. <laughs> it's like, what the hell? What's the point of any of it? Or same analogy, but let's say with amateur boxing and then three in his prime Mike Tyson's hatch out of egg sacks. The only significant difference in those analogies is that it's not necessarily one-on-one. -on -one. It would be like combined punching power or combined speed, which they are not willing to do. <laughs> so I don't know, man, it's tough.